Good Wednesday evening. It's time for our midweek Bible study. So glad that you're able to join us tonight. We want to encourage you in every way to continue your studies of God's Word. Even though we can't meet together, I want to encourage you to stay in God's Word, continue to study, continue to grow closer to Him, draw closer to Him uh, as you study His Word. We continue our study tonight of a living hope as we've been looking from 1 Peter. I don't know if you remember, but initially I was just going to do 1 Peter chapter 1, and I thought that would be a good study for the times we were in. And the more we get into this, the more I see that it's going to be the entire book of 1 Peter, possibly 2 Peter as well. But 1 Peter especially as we're looking and, and learning about this living hope that we have. Tonight our study picks up from where we left off and we continue. We look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 12 through 17. But before we get into the text and before we read that, I want to share with you a little illustration or a little story. A man was being tailgated by a stressed out individual, we'll say. And as they were being tailgated by this stressed out individual, suddenly this man came to an intersection. Well, the light turned yellow. And he probably could have made it through before the red light, but decided with caution to just slow down and stop at the crosswalk, uh, which basically was the right thing to do. That's what uh, you should do, but a lot of times we try to rush through. Well, the individual who was tailgating him was furious because it messed their chance to, to get through the intersection, to get where they needed to be. Again, they were, they were just in an all-fired hurry to get uh, somewhere. And so this person laid on their horn, uh, began screaming in frustration because they missed their chance to get through the intersection. Now they're going to have to wait. Uh, on top of that, their cell phone uh, flew into the floor along with the french fries that they had where they had stopped to get them something uh, to eat, and they were furious. And as this person was in mid-rant, they could hear a tap on their window. As they looked up, they looked into a face of a pretty stern-looking police officer. The officer ordered the person, get out of their car, put their hands up. Well, the officer took this person to the police station where they were searched, they were fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. Well, after a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. Uh, this person was escorted back to the booking area, and the arresting officer was standing there with their personal effects, all the things that they had taken at the time of, of, of the stop. Well, the officer said, I'm very sorry for the mistake. He said, you see, I pulled up behind your car while you were, were blowing the horn, screaming at the guy in front of you at the top of your lungs, saying some words that were not very uh, nice, were, were actually pretty colorful. And I noticed, as you were doing that, I noticed on the window sticker of your car, it said, what would Jesus do? I also noticed that the uh, license plate holder that you had said choose life. I then saw that on your bumper it had a bumper sticker that said follow me to Sunday school. And then I saw this chrome plated fish that was on the back of your trunk and so naturally I assumed you'd stolen the car and that's why you were arrested. You know in our last lesson we learned from Peter that we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation, a people for his own purpose or own possession, a people who've received mercy. And because we are these people and we have this special relationship with God, we're called to live lives differently. We're called to live lives as sojourners, as exiles, and to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Essentially, since you are God's people, here is how you must live. With the privileges of, of, of being God's chosen people come the responsibility of living godly lives. And particularly, what Peter is instructing is he's instructing here how to live as a holy nation. These are the things that we are to do while we're living as exiles in the world. This is what the Christian behavior ought to be. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. Let's go ahead and look at our text. And we'll go ahead and read it first and come back to verse 12. Beginning in verse 12, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Now, now remember, we're talking about these are things that we are to do while living as exiles in the world. Not living as if this world is our home, but in the meantime, as we live upon this earth, how should we live? What should our life look like? 
What should our behavior be? He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. And in verse 17 it says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Go back to verse 12 for just a moment. Because the first thing we see in how we ought to live as exiles, sojourners in this world, is that we are to live lives that are honorable. Uh, Now when you consider that, you, you consider that to live an honorable life is to live in a way that is respectable while here on earth. Keep your living honorable. And notice that that we are to be living honorable lives, if you go back to the text and look, living honorable lives in the face of those who speak against us as evildoers. So how, how are we as Christians supposed to handle those who in the world who slander us, who consider us to be evildoers? Well, we're not to handle it by acting like they do. <laughs> uh, we're not to handle it by uh, handle it by treating them as they've treated us. You know, I, I tell my children all the time. You know, just because he did that to you doesn't mean you do that back to him. And and so we as adults sometimes we act like children because we want to do right back to them what they've done to us. But living honorable lives means you don't do that. We're to handle this by living honorably. We're to continue to conduct ourselves as Christians even when what others are doing seems unjust or unfair, uh, when, it's, when it's just it, it's, it's horrible to us or, or, or we just don't understand why they're doing it. We can still act like Christians no matter what. That never changes. And what's going to happen is the world will speak evil of us as evildoers, especially as we're, we're striving and trying to expose the darkness with the light of Jesus. You remember, those who are in the world are living in darkness, and they like living in darkness. And we as Christians, we're to be living in the light, walking in the light. And so we're shedding light on the darkness, opening their eyes up to the way they're living, and they're not going to like it. They're not going to understand why we're living the way we're living. We understand that they don't need to be living that way. They need to come to Jesus. But we're going to encounter all sorts of uh, resistance when we try to live righteously, when we try to speak righteously, when we try to teach righteously. And so be ready for it. it. It's going to come. But even more important, when that does come, live honorably. Don't give them a reason to think that they're right about you. You know, when we retaliate or respond similarly, we are only validating their accusations, you know, not proving them uh, to be false. And so what Peter says is, live honorably in the face of, of such difficulty or duress so that they're going to see your good works and they're going to glorify God later. They're going to come to realization uh, that they were wrong that they shouldn't have done those things. They shouldn't have said those things. They shouldn't have treated them. They, they want to live like we're living. They're going to see our good deeds in the face of evil and, and may change to glory, glorify God before the judgment. And so remember this. Your reaction to the slander and the evil that others may bring upon you can change them. If you respond the way they are treating you, it will not change anything. They'll think, okay, you're just like me. But the way you handle their slander and, and their uh, evil doings, their duress, can cause them to glorify God later. They will possibly rethink what they are doing. And you know, you, when, you, when you're trying to understand this better or uh, realize why, Jesus is an outstanding example of this. You remember causing the Roman centurion to confess that Jesus, that he was truly the Son of God in Matthew 27 and verse 24. All the events that surrounded Jesus and how he handled it proved to this outsider that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And so how we handle all the pressures and all the difficulties that surround us is going to prove to others that we truly are living stones. Remember going back to what we've talked about earlier? 
that we truly are molded after the image of Jesus, that we're truly trying to live like Jesus, that we're truly different, we will not be a discredit to the name Christian if we live lives that are honorable. And that's what Peter is telling us. Let's go back to our text and look at some really interesting um, information here. And what we find here, especially in light of all that is happening, um, may the Lord bless us during this time uh, of, of strife and contention and hatred and uh, ugliness that we see throughout all of this election stuff. This is some very important information that every Christian needs to be reminded of. We are to yield to human government, verses 13 through 15. Notice that the command is to be in subjection to every human institution. It doesn't matter what that institution is. We are to yield to it. And Peter goes even further to make sure that we understand that he means every human institution by adding whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by the emperor. He's basically saying whoever is in charge, that is who we are to yield to. We are to yield to any authority. Now, as Christians, we sometimes forget this charge. We're not called, let me say this again, we are not called to be zealots who riot and picket against the government. We're seeing some outrageous behavior uh, from those on both sides of, of, of how they're talking about one another, how they're talking about uh, who's in charge and all this. It is, it is terrible, and, and it, it changes nothing. It only reveals the heart of those individuals. But we have seen, you know, extremes in religion where I guess we could say people re refuse to do things for their faith. They say, well, I'm not going to do that because of my faith. And we see people unwilling to state their allegiance to, to this country. But, but we're subject to the laws of this nation. And we live in this nation. And we're told to respect that and honor that. Verse 18, going back uh, to what it says um, it says, or we're told to respect uh, that, honor the emperor. It's, it's part of this instruction in, in verse 18. And, and so it's, it's important for us to, to understand this. But we have to watch that we are not at the other side of the corn. You know, we think that everything about this country is what matters. So we become activists trying to overthrow various laws and, and systems. Well, the point that Peter is, is making is that Christians are to keep themselves and obey the laws. We are to, to conduct ourselves, going back to what we said in verse 12, conduct ourselves honorably. And I think we can see the damage that's done by those who refuse to obey these rules. You know, you have on one side the religious right uh, has probably done more damage than good for the cause of Jesus. Because it's a it's a radicalism, uh, you know. This radicalism is is only another reason for the world to discredit God, and so we have to be careful in our blending of politics with Christianity. Certainly, we don't separate our Christianity from anything. I heard someone say that you need to leave your your religion out of your politics. Well, if 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 I understand right, in Christ. I don't separate anything from that. I am a Christian through and through. And so my Christianity, my religion, my, my following of Jesus, it is to change the way I live and the way I see the world. It, it, it is, I'm not to put that in a box. I'm not to shut that up just you know, when it comes election year. It means that I'm always a Christian. And so while we certainly should see... Uh, and use our freedom to advance the kingdom of God, we have to be careful that we're not in the process of hurting the influence of the kingdom of God. God's will is that we do good. Silencing the, the criticism by our, our good works, not discrediting God by our good works, but doing good, living honorable lives. And, you know, we live in such a time that... You have social media, and you post things, and, and these things can really hinder or discredit um, your influence. They can, they can hurt your influence for God and for the kingdom if you're not careful. So, you know, be mindful of those things. And sometimes we let things slip. Sometimes we uh, get caught up in the moment. But we've got to be, be careful. But what Peter is saying, going back to verses 13 through 15, 
is, is we are to submit to every human authority. And why is that? Well, we do that for the sake of the Lord. We're doing this for the cause of Christ. This is God's will. We are only going to bring change for the kingdom by working to change the hearts of the individuals in this country. Now, trying to change laws will not fix the problem. There is no politician, there is no person uh, in that, those leadership roles that are going to change the world. The only one who is going to change the world is Jesus, and he did. The changing of people's hearts is really what's going to, to bring about change. And so, if you think about it, if we don't like the direction of, of our country... Uh, I do not believe the answer is to become more politically active and, and raise our voices in shouting down others or shouting about the government and shouting about its laws. Uh, what we are to do is we are to show subjection to the government and not look like religious extremists. If we don't like the, the direction of our country, the answer is to become more evangelistic with the gospel. That's the answer. If we want to change things, then we need to change the hearts of people. And that's what the gospel does. Jesus is the one who changes people. Jesus is our example in this. Because when he came to this world to establish his kingdom, how did, how did he, he go about establishing it? He didn't do it by trying to overthrow the Jewish government. He didn't do it by trying to change Roman laws. What he did is he submitted to those things. And Jesus established his kingdom by preaching the gospel to every person. You know, one, one person at a time. The gospel spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And that has to be our focus. Change the hearts one person at a time with the gospel. Not through being a political activist or zealots. We don't, we, we don't need more activists. We need more ambassadors for Christ. That's what we need in this world. But again, we go back to our text. If you go a little further in verse 16... Peter tells us to live as people who are free. We are to, to be using our freedom to live as God's servants. That, that's what we are to do with our freedom. We're not to use our freedom to, as, as a cover to commit evil. Just because you know our government is, is lax on laws doesn't give us the authority to break God's laws. Yield to the government. Obey the laws of God. Do not use your freedom to commit evil. Live as exiles, knowing that the kingdom of God is really, that's what, that's what comes first. And that's what should always come first. And so let's look at the last part. Let's look at verse 17. And what we find in verse 17 is Peter ends this thought with four quick admonitions. He says, honor everyone. Now, if you're looking at your Bible, I want to encourage you to underline that word everyone. There's no excuses. It doesn't matter how someone treated us. There's um, there's not excuse that if, if we were disrespected, then we have the right to disrespect that person. Put the interest of others first always. Show them honor. Show them respect. E even if they don't respect you, be aware that this is um, how we're to be. Honor people in the world. And so Peter will, will speak about how to treat Christians in just a moment, but basically here when he says honor everyone, honor all people. Look at what he says next. Love the brotherhood. You know, among the, the family of believers, there should be even greater respect and honor. And as you think about this, this love is a, a symbol to the world. We, we know that if we treat each other like the world treats one another, then what is the attraction for coming into the family of, of Christ? If we bicker, if we fight, if, if, if the kingdom doesn't look like um, you know, what God intended it to look like, why would people, or people want to be a part of God's family? There's no attraction if that's the case. And so we're to love the brotherhood. We should have such a strong, deep love for one another that it's going to cause people to glorify God and it's going to cause people to want to be a part of that family and a part of that relationship. And that's why Peter is telling us this is how we are to live. And he says, fear God. Uh, be exiles in this world means that we must always show our allegiance uh, to God. God must always be first in everything. If we do not show God uh, to be first and show our reverence and our fear for God, then we're going to discredit God. Uh, how, we'll, how, how are we going to influence uh, the world if we treat God the with the same importance as we do our hobbies or our recreation or our work? 
and Christians, that's what we do a lot of times. A lot of times we put more emphasis on our hobbies and our jobs and uh, our recreation and all those things, and we put God on the back burner, and what we're doing is discrediting God. We're saying God is no more important than any of those other things. He's just, whenever I can fit Him in, that's what it's going to be. We're certainly not fearing God in that case. We're st- certainly not respecting God as as being priority and first in our life. Nobody is going to come to God if God is seen as, as, as just another activity in our life. And so what Peter says is because of, again, going back to what uh, was revealed in our last lesson, because of all of these things, because you're His chosen people, a royal priesthood, then fear God, show your passion to God, reveal your zeal for God, because God is first. That's that's it in a nutshell. But then look at the last thing. He says, honor the emperor. If a, if a Roman emperor was to be honored and respected, then every government official deserves that same honor. Uh, we may not agree with them. We might not like the things that they say. It, it Again, it doesn't mean that we're going to agree with their lives or decisions or their actions, but it does mean that we are not slanderers. What I see a lot of people doing is, is being accusers, uh, calling you know certain leaders certain names, saying that they're this and that, and they're being very disrespectful. But that is not what we're to do. We're not going to speak ill of our leaders. We need to be praying for our leaders. Uh, we don't ignore their evil, though, but, but their evil is not a license for us to speak uh, or act ungodly. That's what Peter says. Christians, we need to get that. We, we need to truly understand that because we are aliens and strangers in this world, and we need to show a, a different life from the way others act. We need to live lives that are honorable, Uh, reflecting the laws and the attitudes of Jesus and realize that our good deeds should sway people to favor the Lord. Um, And so how we live matters. That's what Peter is saying. You have this living hope. Now live in such a way that brings glory to God in order that your life and your actions and your deeds will help others see and say, I need to be different. Are you being different? We have this living hope We need to live like it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us, our time together tonight. I just hope and pray that our time is is a a beneficial and blessing, and we continue ourselves as individuals studying to draw closer to you and understanding how you desire for us to live so that we can live with you for all eternity. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Appreciate you being with us tonight. I love you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.